Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session. What will determine the future of energy demand? Uh, over the past decade, global energy demand has been rising steadily at a rate of around 1.3% annually. But in the last year alone, it jumped by 2.2%, well above the long term average. What's fueling the surge, interestingly, is, isn't just population growth or economic growth. It's the rapid emergence of a new power-hungry industry, particularly the AI and data centers that are rewriting the rules of the game. Analysts are calling this the age of electricity, where the question is no longer simply one of supply and demand, but of where industries will migrate, can the technology keep up, and who will shape the infrastructure of the next era of uh, industry. In some parts of the US today, the influx of data centers have already pushed retail electricity prices significantly higher. Utilities are scrambling to add capacity. Regulators are trying to play catch up. And investors are piling in in order to finance the the grids, building the grids and the generation that uh, is needed to feed this digital beast. But there is a flip side to that narrative. Much of today's energy infrastructure planning hinges on lofty AI demand forecasts. One such forecast uh, sees global electricity demand from data centers to more than double by 2030. That will equal to about Japan's total power consumption today. If those assumptions do not materialize, we risk overbuilding, we risk stranding assets, and therefore the paradox is, will AI eat the grid or will AI eat itself? I'm going to explore this landscape. Uh, we're joined by a distinguished panel here, Mr. Ashraf Al Ghazawi, the EVP of Strategy and Cor Corporate Development at Saudi Aramco, and Mr. Fred Thiel, the Chairman and CEO of uh, Mara. Um, I'm going to start with you, Fred, and ask you. You know, we've, we have this growing tension uh, today between the exponential demand for AI and the speed at which we're building the clean energy and building out the grid. From your point of view, as a, one of the largest Bitcoin miners, which side is currently winning, supply or demand? Well, I think demand is definitely winning at this point. Um, there's a question of uh, how that, the characteristics of that demand, and I think we're gonna talk some more about that a little bit later regarding uh, flexible and inflexible load. But right now, the expectation is that AI will consume huge amounts of energy. And as you pointed out, the energy industry has not been building out capacity because demand has only been growing at about 2% a year over the past 20 years. And so it's a systemic shock. So definitely there is a need for building out additional supply. I think the bigger constraint is transmission capacity. Um, but we're also seeing the large hyperscalers, the Metas, the Googles, Microsofts, and others, are even going into the power generation business themselves. They're starting to build gas to power uh, facilities. And I think there are two risks. One is that the utilities don't want to overbuild. But at the same time, if the hyperscalers build so much energy generation capacity that they become utilities as they become more efficient, what happens to the profitability of the grid? And I think that's the bigger risk where AI could eat the grid we're going to explore that question further. Um, Ashraf, uh, we know that 80% of incremental energy demand globally comes from emerging countries. So the global south needs cheap and reliable energy. So that's on one side. On the second side, we've got these rising uh, new industries, the AI and the data centers. That's concentrated in the global north currently. So how does Aramco look at your short-term decision-making uh, and your longer-term strategical planning when you want to address these two um, you know, mega-trends 
uh, in the decades to come? Well, I'll, I'll say that we, we don't see them as separate trends. Mm. Uh, when we go about developing our mid to long term strategy, it's essentially answering the question, how much will demand grow and where the supply to fulfill that, that demand uh, is coming from. So we really don't see them. I mean, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's demand. We see it a little bit differently that you know, demand is going to win because you will not have demand without, without supply. I mean, some, somehow the supply is going to, to come from somewhere. And you're right. You, know, you obviously have to cater for you know, a global south or the emerging uh, economy's needs. You have this massive uprise in, in the demand from, from data centers. And that will have to come from somewhere. Now, how we go about our strategy is exactly that, you know, looking at those trends and understanding what sources of energies will, will need it to supply them. That being said, I think the common thread between both sides of that equation is reliability. Mm. You won't allow uh, economies to grow without reliable, sustainable, and affordable energy. And anybody who does AI and data centers know that the reliability is the name of the game. You have to be able to provide reliable energy to these data centers to unlock the full potential of AI. Aramco, um, yeah, the name doesn't really ring a bell when people talk about AI, but you've been dealing with AI for many, many years and with its applications. We'll come to that uh, later and to, to your understanding of AI. Fred, beyond just building more power plants. Some argue the real game changer is making demand itself smarter. How do you see technologies like AI, flexible pricing, co-location co uh, or co-located generation in reshaping how energy intensive industries consume power, industries such as yourself as a Bitcoin miner? So the Duke University did a study earlier this year where they estimated that total demand for energy for the AI industry uh, over the next few years would be roughly 48 gigawatts of power. They also said that there is 73 gigawatts of power available in North America today if the AI load was flexible for up to 2% of the time. So what does that mean? Imagine a data center that could modulate its load on the grid to the available amount of electricity such that the grid could maintain a flat load. And our industry is the world's best flexible load. And when you marry what we do with AI, you can essentially imbibe to AI a flexible characteristic such that instead of having to increment your peak capacity, you can operate within the existing capacity because the biggest challenge is not building generation, it's building transmission. Getting electricity from the generator to the load is the biggest problem globally. It's different in the developing world because it's easier to build. In the developed world, it's impossible. And so we focus on putting load at generation, behind the meter. A lot of what we do sits behind the meter at renewable sites. So we're able to avoid these congestion issues. But if AI can become flexible by marrying its technology with what we do, then all of a sudden there are more than ample areas, including in the kingdom today, um, we've been having these conversations with the Ministry of Energy, to use the existing capacity without impacting peak. Interesting. Um, uh, Fred, as AI moves from training to um, large-scale inference, energy demand will also be shifting from those concentrated data centers and more towards the applications, more towards the edge. How do you see this evolution reshaping how energy demand is consumed and could inference AI change the very geography um, of energy demand? Uh, absolutely. The if you think about AI, there are basically two things. One is you build and train models. The other thing is you then use inference to gain insights and actually drive value. So the profitable part of the business is inference. It's not the training. Training is kind of a lost leader, especially if you look at open AI today. Um, if you think about that, the key constraint in inference, um, there are three. One is private cloud and sovereignty of data. For example, I'm sure uh, Aramco doesn't want to put their seismic data out into the public cloud 
They want to keep that close at hand. 70% of corporate data today still is not in the cloud. It's kept behind corporate firewalls. And so inference is something you run at the edge. You run it on site in the corporate world. Because there's another constraint, network capacity. There isn't enough high speed, low latency network capacity, just like transmission in the electrical grid, <clears throat> to get your data to the cloud and back. And so you need to run it near prem. So <clears throat> what that means, excuse me, is that all of a sudden you will see data centers at the edge in the basements, if you would, of the Aramco towers. You'll see data centers sitting in the oil field, digital twins of drilling systems out in the field, which are essentially a digital version of the drill with all the seismic data guiding the drill operator, the master driller, as to where to put the drill. That's all operating at the edge. To do that, you have to have special infrastructure, but you're not talking about gigawatts of power. Inference doesn't need huge amounts of power. And the risk, I think, back to your original question, does AI eat the grid or vice versa, is you develop big models in the cloud, but the model you actually use in production is much smaller. And so over time, you're going to build intelligence out at the edge. And everything you use for production, supply, distribution of oil, distribution of gas, etc., will have an AI component that will run near or next to what it does. Now, there will be one type of inference which will be done in the cloud, and that is you have high security, high sovereignty, um, high privacy data you want to keep close at hand with low latency. But there are other jobs that may be production analysis that are kind of monthly reports. You may want to run that in very low cost inference sites, which could be remote locations where the cost per token is the lowest. And I think that is the key driver in this uh, business today is the cost per token. You're spending all this money focusing on high cost GPU and energy when the real economic metric that you as a customer use is cost per token. And I want the lowest cost per token. So if I can essentially um, fragment my inference, low latency, high privacy, close by, high latency, lower need for privacy, still sovereign though, more remote, low-cost energy generation locations. Um, uh, Ashraf, Aramco, we've mentioned before that it's been dealing with AI for many years uh, in its different applications and forms. Um, AI is both a major new consumer of uh, electricity and also a potential tool to radically improve efficiency. So my question to you is, do you believe AI could meaningfully bend the energy demand curve moving forward uh, at the back end of that curve? Or will, it, will its own appetite outweigh those efficiency gains? So let me start by saying yes. I mean, we are not new to AI. We, we have been uh, adopters and heavy users of AI for years. And that was built on, on top of a digital and computing infrastructure that was built over decades. We, you know, we have our own 70 billion parameter large language model that we trained on 93 years of data. The example of, of drilling and how it's enabled by AI, actually, this is not something that we're going to do. This is already happening. You know, we're generating real-time logs for, for drilling activities that helps us minimize emissions and minimize cost of, of our upstream activities. So, so we understand what, what, what comes and what's associated with, with AI. So to your question, and I think like everything around us, efficiency ultimately will help, but it's not going to be necessarily from AI as, uh, as, uh, on, its, on its own. You know, we've seen efficiencies help the world not consume the amount of energy that it's supposed to be, so that you know, energy demand is not growing you know, uh, in parallel or, or at the rate of global economy, and that is attributed to efficiency, and we see it the same thing. But it's not going to be AI alone. You will have efficiencies in the algorithms, you will have efficiencies on the computing platform. The chips themselves will, will become more efficient. And you will probably see efficiencies in the way data centers are designed and the, and the cooling requirements in data centers. And I think all of these factors combined could lead at the end of the day to bending the curve to your point. Mm -hmm. um, 
Fred, the, uh, in a minute, the surge in uh, power demand requires massive infrastructure at unprecedented speed. Um, what are the real bottlenecks there? I think we've talked a little bit about it. One of the bottlenecks is you have to generate electricity. That requires permitting, it requires land, it requires all sorts of things. Transmission is the other. You have to get the supply to where the load is. Um, and I think the developed world, if you think about the U.S. and Europe, are the, uh, it's very hard in those markets to develop new energy. They've spent, uh, over the past decade, a lot of capital in building renewable energy. The problem with renewable energy, such as wind and solar, is it's intermittent, and it makes planning grid operations infinitely more difficult. Um, you, know, you can look at uh, different countries around the world either have huge energy shortages or some have actually electrical energy surpluses. Um, I think the global south, and especially the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, is extremely well positioned because you have abundant low-cost energy, you have abundant land, mm. You have a long-term vision in um, His Highness's Vision 2030, where you now have an ability to plan so that potentially the kingdom could be essentially a global hub for operating low cost per token inference for those types of tasks that people are willing to put their data into a Saudi cloud versus necessarily a US or European or Asian cloud. And this is where probably AI sovereignty comes. And um, we've seen the announcement or heard the announcement yesterday of uh, Aramco uh, and Humane. So uh, a new venture for Aramco there. We've got seconds left on the clock. Ashraf, will AI eat the grid or will AI eat itself? I think that there, is, there is a happy you know, uh, you know, possibility here where actually if it's done right and it's planned right, you know, and, and people make deliberate investment decisions in infrastructure and in data centers, you could actually avoid the scenario because it ultimately it's the dollar per token. And people who, who you know, invest uh, deliberately and make all the right investment decisions based on their advantage, you know, position, Saudi Arabia is actually at the heart of this, you know, where you actually don't need to build over capacity and make sure that there is the offtake and the demand side that is guaranteed. So I know like Aramco doesn't like to hear the word stranded assets. Can we see stranded assets when it comes to uh, AI related power uh, utilities? Well, the, the, you know, the answer lies in the dollar per token. You know, mm. th those investors that want to build, they make sure that they have the offtakes, they have the, the, the demand lined up, and that they make sure that they will be able to be competitive on a dollar per token scenario. So hyperscalers, they should hold the risk. They should hold the risk. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, thank you. A very interesting discussion. Uh, audience, uh, thank you for listening in. I hope it was all interesting to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.